This is Black Sheep Radio, W-O-O-L-F-M 91.5 in the broadcast area, and anywhere else you can get internet at wool.fm. That's our website, not .com, not .org. Yes, wool.fm. One of the bands that I am particularly looking forward to at Roots on the River this year is Spite and Dival. They're playing under the Big Tent Saturday, June 4th, 3.30. Um, they're on tour overseas. There's no escape. I had a conversation with Mark Miller from the band through one of those voice over IP things on my cell phone, and it worked out pretty good. We are talking with Mark Miller from Israel, which is super exciting that you guys are out there. This is certainly the farthest from home that we've ever played, and it's been an absolutely amazing tour. We started up on the uh, Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, at the Jacob's Ladder Festival, and uh funny most things in israel are not very well organized but i have to tell you this festival was so beautifully organized better than most of the festivals we play in the uh, united states anybody from any of the other festivals who's listening i'm not talking about your festival (laughs) we had big crowds we played for probably four or five thousand people when we landed we did a workshop with some students at their music school that's kind of like the Berkeley School of Music and just finished a show for the American Embassy in a big uh, outdoor market in Jerusalem. And we're about to head down to the desert. So yes, it's really, it's been great and very exciting. That's, how does something like that happen? The Menachem who runs the Jacob's Ladder Festival is a DJ (laughs) uh, in the Upper Galilee and we've always sent our CDs to him, and he plays our CDs, and Beth is wonderful about emailing DJs when they play our music, and so they developed um, a rapport, and we found out about the festival, and this year, you know, he just really fell in love with the CD and decided it was time, so they brought us out. And then uh, the American Embassy actually was a huge help in putting together uh, the rest of the tour. I saw a couple of pictures on your Facebook feed, and actually the Jacob's Ladder Festival looked a lot like Roots on the River. It was funny you say that, because I was thinking, we haven't been to Roots on the River yet, but everything that I have read about it and everything that I know about it from talking to other artists made me think that of the festivals that we play, this is probably going to be the most similar in feel. So it's going to be great back to back. We're excited. We'll come home. We'll adjust from the jet lag and then we'll head up to Vermont. Roots kicks off a bunch more summer festivals for you guys. This summer is looking really exciting for us. Roots on the River was really the big new one. Also, the Great South Bay Music Festival is new for us out on Long Island. We've been at the Philadelphia Folk Festival. I think this will be our fourth year. I actually do some programming down there. I put together uh, about six hours of programming and get to book a lot of our friends and other artists Mm -hmm. in a big collaborative uh, review type of session. And we'll be back with our friends at Falcon Ridge, uh, Pesky J. Nixon. They run the lounge stage, Mm -hmm. so we'll be back with them. And, oh, and New Bedford. The New Bedford Folk Festival is another one that we love because the, it's a very collaborative in spirit. I mean, they really build it right into the programming. Most of the sessions on their big stage have three or four artists playing together around a theme, which is mm. we're very social. So that's exactly the kind of thing that we like. Uh, here's a question that you probably haven't heard before. Spite and Dival? Uh, <laughs> what that, does it mean? Yeah, what's that about? <laughs> okay, so we live in the city of Yonkers, which is just north of Manhattan. Yonker in Dutch is squire, like a young squire. Mm. So all the Bronx and Yonkers used to be the lands of the squire, Adrian Vanderdonk. Um, and I have a particular interest in the pre-English history of uh, New York when it was New Amsterdam. Um, it really was founded on principles of religious tolerance and 
a lot of personal freedoms that were really unheard of mm. politically in that time. It was a movement, an intellectual movement coming out of uh, the Netherlands, the United Provinces of the Netherlands. So that's an interest of mine, and we wanted to root ourselves to the area that we lived. And there's this really old, cool Dutch place name, uh, Spite and Dival, which was the creek that separated the island of Manhattan from the Squire's lands, or what, what's now the Bronx. And it was the narrowest place to cross onto the island, but because you have the tides of two rivers of different lengths and depths coming together, the currents and the whirlpools, it's, it was the shortest but the most dangerous place to cross. I've asked some Dutch people what the actual words mean, but it's been sort of bastardized and colloquialized over the, over time. As far as I can tell, a spout is a pump that you would use to pump canal water to wash windows. Mm -hmm. But when I was in Amsterdam a year ago, I asked some folks about that, and they were like, uh, actually, these days, a spout is a hypodermic needle. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. But then Washington Irving came along uh, during the English period, and he just decided to interpret it as in spite of the devil and that was really the phrase that caught our attention because that's kind of connected with the way that we do things and the way that we live and it's on the hip flasks it is indeed on the hip flasks are there those hip flasks going to be at the merch table they will absolutely be at the merch table uh most people ask us if we fill them before sale, but uh, we are not legally allowed to do that. But uh, anybody who's thinking about it, bring a little Jameson's and uh, or whatever it is that you like and uh, fill them up. And, you know, if you're not a drinker or you have kids, uh, we have a screw-on nipple attachment. And you can just use it as a dippy cup. How does a band from the Yonkers, uh, the whole Dutch history thing that you're into aside, start doing old-time blues, second-line bluegrass, folk rock, punk stuff well we're 20 minutes in the car outside in new york city so even though people in brooklyn think that we're upstate and there are polar bears where we live <laughs> um it's actually very close to manhattan and you know the hudson valley has a long and rich history of, of folk music and the folk revival and beth and i ran a concert series in yonkers in an environmental center where pete seeger's canoe was hanging in the rafters. It was a very active folk and roots scene. Once I started getting into that music, I just kept going back and back and back and got sort of back behind the folk revival to the old time music. Mm -hmm. And I just love, I love the energy of it. And I love the fact that it's social music that's really intended to be played together by people and not like bluegrass music where people stand on the stage and play and people sit in the audience and listen. Our whole band started as a porch jam at our house with people drinking beer and eating barbecue and playing music together. And we've really tried to carry that social idea forward in all of the music that we do and how we've grown as a band. So it can get a little raucous on stage. Uh, we do our best. <laughs> we do our best. Listen, in our scene, in the folk scene, there's a lot of confessional music and there are a lot of sad stories. And mm -hmm. we've decided to leave that to other people. And we feel like our role when we come to a show is to bring joy and excitement and energy to the show. And we want to, you know, lively things up. So it does, it does get pretty raucous. Drums, bass, guitar, guitar, uh, extra points for having a harmonica player. <laughs> Jim's a wonderful guy. He brings a lot to the band. Yes, having a harmonica player who's not a guitar player who plays a little harmonica is, uh, has been a real benefit and really helped to define the sound. He really goes for that cross heart Chicago blues sound, mm. plays through a little tube amp and green bullet mic. It definitely helps to bring clarity to what we do and beth has some pipes she's got a wonderful voice and i i think in some ways part of the way the project got started is we've been married for 20 years and i knew she had that and putting the project together really gave her an opportunity to get back into music and to share that lucky us lucky me 
If you've heard me sing, you can understand <laughs> when I say, from a project perspective, lucky me. In a couple of the press photos, the uh, the drummer seems to be holding a little baseball bat. Is there something we should know? <laughs> uh, uh, I don't. I don't really know. I don't really. I, uh, the photographer who took those pictures, uh, Ed Keating. He does a lot of shooting for the New York Times and has a long history of war photography. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess he was looking to toughen us up a bit. <laughs> the uh, the third album, The Social Music Hour, Volume 1, nominated for an International Folk Music Award 2015 Album of the Year. Cool. Yeah. It comes from Harry Smith's Anthology of American Music. Well, that was certainly my inspiration to get back to that period. The idea was to look for songs that are from that period that we found lyrically relevant and musically relevant that we could bring forward and and make modern and have them appeal to an audience with a more contemporary sensibility. It was a pretty exhaustive process. There's a book called Rise Up Singing, uh, which most of the folkies will know that contains hundreds or thousands of old folk songs in, you know, with chords and lyrics. And Joe Ayadanza, our producer, and I went through that book cover to cover, pulled all the public domain songs out of there. So that was about 400 songs. Then we looked to see whether the songs had been recorded too many times, and that cut it down to about 200, which we listened to. We played 40 of them or so, just he and I, brought about 20 to the band, and then recorded 13, one of which uh, didn't make it on the record. The biggest difference between making this record and the other records is for this record, first of all, we had a great team. Producer and the engineer were phenomenal. We have a studio in our house, so we weren't driving into Midtown like we were for some of our other records. And for this one, we set the entire band up live and we tracked everything as a whole band live without a click track and very, very minimal overdubbing. I learned a lot. I mean, I'll never go back to doing it the other way because when you do it this way, if you're a band that plays together, and we are, every time you edit something, every time you go back and start cutting and slicing something, after a while, everything that really makes music exciting and meaningful to listen to gets edited out if you don't have a lot of self-control. Uh, I would say that was the thing, the most revelatory thing about making this record. Quite a few of the artists that I've been talking to that are going to be playing the festival this year have mentioned this exact thing that, that you're talking about, changing up the way they record and the benefits of going in and being real. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I can I give you a really simple example, which is when you go in a more typical studio situation and everybody's being recorded in these little tiny rooms and all the rooms are different. When you sit down to mix the record, you end up spending half of your time just trying to get it so that everybody sounds like they're in the same room. Mm. I can tell you it's a hell of a lot easier to get everybody to sound like they're <laughs> in the same room if they're just in the same room. And, and you also, you can, you can look at each other and you can, you know, play off of each other. If you're overdubbing, the interplay only goes in one direction. You can only play against what's already been recorded. And if you come up with something spontaneous and brilliant, people can't respond to it. I was giving advice to some young guys who contacted us uh, wanting to open for us at some shows. And I listened to their recordings and I said, you know, it took us a while to get to this point, but what we understand now is that people want truth. They don't want perfection. Making a record that's true to how you play and who you are and how you feel is a lot more important than making a technically perfect record. Mm. Uh, something you did recently is pretty interesting to me anyways, the Linda Ronstadt project. Yeah, that was fun. <laughs> that was fun. We're a very social band, and a lot of what we find enjoyable and satisfying about being musicians is getting to hang out with other musicians. You know, when we were not making music, that's probably the thing that I miss the most. Hmm. So we have a friend who's another promoter local.
locally who is actually uh, suffering from early stage Parkinson's. Mm. He and I started to work on this project and it was an opportunity for us to pay tribute to an artist that we love. And, you know, Linda Ronstadt's a little more pop than us, so it's a little bit of a guilty pleasure. But when you really sit down and you listen to her, the breadth and the, and the depth and the scope of her work, she was a phenomenal interpreter. And I would even go as far as to say, even though the idiom that she was recording in was more of rock or country or pop. She really is a folk artist in the sense that she was interpreting the works of other writers and in many cases bringing them forward from like the 50s to the 70s and the 40s to the 70s. Mm -hmm. So it was an opportunity to raise money for a good cause, to work with another promoter and to work with a lot of the artists that uh, we're close to in the immediate region. So it was a lot of fun. There's a quote that I'm going to pull uh, from Sing Out. Mark Moss wrote this. He described you as unapologetically writing that line between reverence for the source material and enjoying the reckless abandon that comes from making those traditions live. <laughs> Mark, Mark I, I love Mark Moss and I appreciate that quote. Um, yeah, we don't ever want to be like a museum piece band, you know, wear old-fashioned clothes and try to mimic the sound that you hear on those old 78 records. I mean, there's a place for that, but I think, I, I think what is much more interesting is to live this process of traditional music, you know, traditional music that survives. It survives because it's still relevant to people taking that idea and using modern arrangement and orchestration and, you know, instrumental ideas to breathe life into these tunes is not just a, a an interesting idea, but I think it's an important thing to do. I'm going to go out on a song. Uh, what do you What do you think? Should it be Skillet or another one? Sure, play Skillet. I love that recording. Yeah, it gives you a good sense of who we are as a band. Thank you so much for uh, taking the time from across like an ocean and a sea. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Really looking forward to it. Are you going to be at the festival? Going to see you? I wouldn't miss it. We're so excited with the lineup at this year's festival. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Uh, the Steel Wheels and Della May and Joe Crookston and a new act that we just discovered recently, Lula Wiles. Yeah. There's a, and, of course, Mary Gaucher. I, mm -hmm. I actually took my one and only songwriting class mm -hmm. with Mary Gaucher. It was her first class that she taught, and it was the first class I took. And I pretty much owe whatever I am as a songwriter, I owe to Mary and her advice. And so we're just really excited about the rest of the lineup and the opportunity to be in a beautiful place um, and listen to a lot of great music. Have fun where you are while you're there. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> Bye. Good and 
drunk and boozy all the time, time, time. Fat back and beans and them good old collard greens. Keep your skillet good and greasy all the time, time, time. Keep your skillet good and greasy all the time.